For two decades, Somalia has been a byword for a failed state. Civil war in the 1990s led to the deaths of thousands of people and the displacement of thousands more. Renewed violence from 2006 between the government and religious radical fighters spared a fresh exodus of Somalis over the country's borders. One exile is Asha Haji, Somali human rights activist and politician who had to move with her family to Nairobi. Asha is recognized internationally for her humanitarian work. She travels as often as she can to Somalia to support war victims through the organization she helped to found 20 years ago, Saving Somalia's Women and Children, or SSWC. In July 2012, Asha prepares to travel to Mogadishu to visit SSWC's offices. The first time she has been able to travel to Mogadishu in just over a year because of the security situation. Whoa. Yeah, she's a role model for all of us. She's very inspirational, yeah. Uh, she, she, a lot of people might say she's inspirational to the younger girls, but I think she's an inspiration to everybody who wants to make like a positive change in their society, you know? Uh, my mom goes when I do my things, but I miss my mom too much. She's involved in something, and to make that happen, she has to make some sacrifices in her life. And we're like willing to help her make that sacrifice. I will not be threatened by the horrendous actions of the enemy of life and peace. I know I will die one day. I'd rather die pursuing peace and justice in my country. Any travel in Somalia, even the capital, requires heavy security. The militant group Al-Shabaab have lost control of the city, but their fighters are still at large. The Somali crisis deepened in 2011 when famine hit. Hundreds of thousands of people fled their homes in search of food. Many ended up in refugee camps in Mogadishu. SSWC's work with women and children covers many issues caused by the insecurity of the camps. At this place, as you could see, is a gender based violence women health crisis center. It is a newly established center. We used to have an old center, but that center is no longer safe. So this is fully operational now, though it is not yet the center doesn't have yet all the equipment that we wanted this center to have, but it is very much in service right now. And Halima is the coordinator of the gender-based uh, gender violence. She will explain to you more, and she will give you uh, the essence of this center. So what we can start is, this is, this is the first stop, yeah? Where the interview is taking place. And then we have, this is the psychosocial and legal aid office, and then you can come through this side. This is the first stop for the medical assistance before any first aid or any first assistance to be given before transfer to SOS. Every country who actually experiences any conflict, there is high rape, definitely. At, at the moment, it's a high, high, high rate of rapes. We, we normally get a roughly of like 10 to 15 women in a daily base. Yes, that's how bad it is. This is a specific room for uh, confidentiality and confidence anyway for the survivor to feel. Then we have one of the survivors who's getting assistance. What is all the Okay. Uh, one person, one of the perpetrators had a gun 
who was actually standing outside in order for him not to allow people to help her. And three of them were inside doing the incident, as in raping her. What they did is they blindfolded her and then they continued the incidents by using, hitting her with the back of the gun. Whereby now it's, it's more or less violence as well as rape. Whatever force they used to actually uh, perpetrate the, the, the incident made her, contributed more internal uh, problems to herself than external. And she's actually bleeding. There's sort of blood coming out from her vagina. She's got two daughters. They could see there's no anywhere. It's not like you have another bedroom that you can you can make them sleep. It's the same bush. When the situation is happening, the kids are there. So it's it's more. It's, it's just an unbelievable situation. A child seeing his mother being raped by three men. You could understand the amount of pain and trauma and emotional devastation it caused that car with. It's so painful. My fear today is not only for her life, also for, for those young daughters who have seen that horror happening to their mother in front of their eyes. So it is a huge responsibility that we are all, all of us are shouldering as far as humanity is concerned. I'm very much worried about their future, their health. So uh, let's just let them continue with their supervision and then we'll proceed to our next room, please. Focus on Avanel. We try to give them the advice, the counseling, the service, and the support they need in this emotional and painful period that they went through. And in fact, the most important thing from us is to show them that we love them, that we are with them, and we care about them. Research conducted by SSWC shows that rape has quadrupled in areas where freelance militia are present. Zone K has one such area in its camp. This is the first time Asha has been able to access the area. Let me see if I can easily recognize this area because this area was not like this. It was the most beautiful part of Mogadishu, this area. It is the neighborhood of my university, the Geher campus. And this scene, what I'm seeing right now, is actually bringing tears to my eyes. The whole neighborhood is completely changed. It was far being an IDB camp. And it's unfortunate that, so that I see to today the neighborhood of the my yellow, university the, the, uh, turned so out is, to be an IDP. Uh, it the, is unfortunate. It is unacceptable. It's a very sad moment, actually. I cannot believe my eyes. Oh, it's very sad. So we... The majority of the women we met this morning are from this. And I never thought that one day one of the appalling and horrible crimes could take place in the most peaceful and beautiful education center. And I never thought that one day in my life I will see this neighborhood, Geher, in this picture. You see? You see, it's made of these things. It, it is unprotected. In the middle of the night, that is where now they just they don't come in and save the women. Women are exposed. 
Do you see anything that is protecting them from the criminals and the perpetrators? Nothing is protecting them. The most important and, and the most precious commodity in Mogadishu today is security, is peace. Six months back, this place was not safe enough for us to come and meet these people. And now the life is, is starting to begin. I was saying that now I, I can smell a peace. The situation is improving, but gradually. There is no capacity for Somali people and Somali government to get out of this mess. It is a collective responsibility for all of us to save this generation. You could see that these people are lacking the basic human needs. They don't have shelter, they don't have water, they don't have education, they don't have life. They have absolutely nothing, you see them. And they deserve, they deserve all these basic human needs. I have hope and faith that Somalia will be back to normal. I have hope and faith that the paradise lost could be found easily. I have hope and faith that Somalia will join the family of nations, but we need the international community support. Albert Einstein said, and I quote, the world is a dangerous place, not because those who do evil, but because those who look on and do nothing. A year on from the drought and famine, more than half a million Somalis are still living in refugee camps, which provide little more than basic shelter. SSWC has provided 62,000 people over the last year with shelter and essential items, mostly organized by Asha's sister, Amina. <laughs> Yeah. These IDB women and children, they came from different directions of Somalia because of the drought and conflict which is going on. Today we are distributing the, the vulnerable and the poorest family among the IDB camps a dignity kit. This dignity kit is included all the important things for the women while they are under the tree, under the IDB camp. And I have been gone through what they are going through just now. While I was under the tree, I get my period. I didn't have anything else. So that's why I committed myself to stay with them and support my capacity. This is what we call the dignity kit, the, the humanitarian dignity kit for women IDBs. Some of us are also we are victims and we experience this kind of situation before now. And that is why when this famine broke out, we immediately came up and designed these special things. Women in this difficult situation don't only need the handouts, the food and the shelter, but they also need and deserve to retain and regain their own dignity. And it could also be as a tool to protect them from the harm of such sexual harassment and such sexual, sexual assault. If the woman is dignified, dressed up, and she covers her body, this itself is a tool for protection of the women.
ايه ابان ابينا ويد اللي تشوغا مركا اديك اي اوداك اي اللي حرور هل كان اوضي ساحة كان لو لو عم ببنا عمل جرت اللي برق لوكا استقرابه ايت من بارس this is everything for them محا عمتان مالنتي محا هشان عمتو مركا مالنتي نرشي انه مرأة تصدح ذا وقت عمتها هشان يا ما هشان ما حد هشان مركي وقف على الطوق ها قلت سبعة لنت إذا تمام أفوني الموت ها ما حب مهلا هاي بمخرب كلها تبي دوا تبي دوا هيدان حولا الله هيدان حولا إذا كباب أي حولي مركي أنا ما هيدان ها شوابة جري موتة واحد هاي عيد مسوقلين ها there, there was no humanitarian agencies and humanitarian uh, assistance that could go there in that area. That is why they flee and came here. She's, uh, she came from Dinsor. That is a Bokol region, one of the one of the worst hit areas, one of the famine affected areas. Abba, Abba, you are away. Family girl, it's that away. She does not have any family. Parents died out of the the dad used to work in a farm. And uh, basically, they were farmers, so they used to get the source of income to support the, the, his family. But since the dad died, it's like they're missing too much. But at the moment, she's feeling lonely. The place was actually dominated by Shabab, so that is the reason why I'm not in the system. I'm going to that place to get the ID to the system. Um, hi, Mama. Marki, I'm I'm so sorry. 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 I'm so so that, that's the trauma they're going through. Everyone has a tragic story to tell in Somalia, and Asha and Amina are no different. In April this year, a bomb blast in the National Theatre left the city again in grief.
My brother was sitting when a criminal suicide bomber blow herself. Someone called me and told me that there is a, a hit bomb is take place in theater and your brother, young brother, was among those who injured. Then from there I ran away to the hospital. <laughs> then I met him. After three nights at the hospital, we organized to send him an ambulance plane. Then that plane took him to Nairobi, then he passed away. <laughs> He left three young, innocent babies, two boys and one girl. They don't know why their fathers passed away, why those who kill him target him. And his, we all don't know. I didn't look when I'm passing here at the theater. I hate the theater. I don't like, I doesn't like to look at the theater. When I'm passing here, I close my eyes because I don't want to see it. The terror attacks and the heinous and horrendous actions by the enemy of life and peace, however much it's painful, will not stop us from doing what we believe in doing. We shall pursue serving humanity. Asha now has a seat in Somalia's new parliament. She also holds weekly training and empowerment sessions to encourage the next generation of Somalian women to be part of its new future. I want these young Somali women, I want to give them the confidence they need. I want to teach them that the sky is their limit, that being a Somali, being a woman, being a Muslim, cannot prevent them from being who they want to be, from doing what they inspire and hope to do. I have hope and faith that you will all realize your dream. And we support you, we encourage you, we love you. We want you to take the leadership from us. We want you to be the leaders of the next future. You are our future. That's what I want to do. So when I grow up, I'll be in Somalia, inshallah, helping my people. Um, I don't want to be a politician or a doctor or anything, but um, basically I want to promote women's football and sports in Somalia because it's, yeah, I'm a football freak. <laughs> <laughs> My sister and I will remain fully committed in serving humanity. I know that I will die one day, but I'd rather die making a difference. This is the future of Somalia. I'm sure that among them are doctors, engineers, teachers, scientists, politicians. I'm sure this is our future.